Welcome to the Jubilee Museum Series. I'm your host, Wanda Dengel, and joining me is Sean Kinney, the Executive Director of the Jubilee Museum in Columbus, Ohio. Sean, I know you have a lot of different exhibit rooms, and one of the rooms that really fascinates me is the one with artifacts from the Holy Land that date back to BC. Absolutely. So when you think of a museum, you know, the first thing you think of are ancient artifacts, old things. You know, you think of the Smithsonian's and whatnot. Um, so you know, the Holy Land room is probably our, what I consider our real museum room at the museum. Um, the nuns' habits and things are neat and it's kind of part of history, but to actually see ancient artifacts um, from part of our collection is just really, really neat. Um, and some of the things that we have in that room, other than just you know, uh, material artifacts, are like vestments. Um, we do have relics. We have Mary Queen of Scots um, necklace mounted on the chalice, which we've had on previous episodes. Um, so it's a fantastic collection that was gifted to us um, by the Franciscans in the Holy Land. Um, which actually later set up a monastery in Washington, D.C., where these things were. And uh, they came to us many years ago and asked if we'd like to have these things. Mm -hmm. uh, they said more people are going to get a chance to have the opportunity to see them. And uh, so far this year, over 4,000 people have seen these artifacts. So it's a, it's a great thing. And, terrific, uh, to terrific. To see this history, it's one thing to talk about it, but to actually see it in person, you know, that was worn by a queen or that was the coin that was, you know, literally there during the time of Christ. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a pretty neat thing. Well, let's begin with the coins, since you brought up Sounds coins. Sounds great. What, what do you have with you here? So as you can see on the screen there, and as well as in my hand, very small. I'll just I'll hold it up. There's no way you're going to see the detail in it. But we have a widow's mite. This is an actual one of the coins, currencies during Christ's life. It's a double-sided piece. One side has an upside-down anchor. And the other one has what's believed to be a carriage wheel. Um, also, there are, are scholars that think it could be a star or the sun. Um, it looks quite like a carriage wheel to me. Mm -hmm. And this actually um, would be a coin um, due to the anchor or carriage wheel, a coin of commerce, actually, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting. Um, but again, not very large. And again, I think you'll, you'll probably go into a little bit more depth, Wanda, on this. Um, you know, today, if you know, we need a coin, a penny or a nickel, you know, we have the different you know, size of the currency. Back then, they would just take the coin and snap a piece of it off. So half of a widow's mite or a quarter, and they would literally uh, do it that way. Um, these coins were made out of bronze or copper. It was a metal that was uh, abundant at the time. And another reason was it could be pounded very easily. It wasn't like steel. If you take a, a sledgehammer to it all day, you're not even going to make a nick in it. This was metal that could be, was very malleable and could be um, stamped and uh, forged pretty easily, um, as well as uh, the copper. It was in abundance, and it could be melted down at a low temperature. So, um, so a lot of the early coins and the, the Roman spear you're going to see later, um, which is copper, it's basically the Statue of Liberty in a spear form. <laughs> and we'll talk about the patina and stuff later. But, uh, but very interesting, um, just a d different time period, but it's amazing the similarities that we even have in our currency today, mm -hmm. going back to the currency then. I think what you've brought with you this uh, t today all can be found in scripture as, as well as in history books like the, the widow's might you just d mentioned. Uh, could we get that image back up? of the widow's might. Um, the, uh, an interesting thing was that um, when Rome occupied Jerusalem and Judea and, and you know, some of the other places, the um, Roman, the smallest Roman coin was the quadrants, and the widow's might was the smallest coin in Judea. In fact, you had to have two widow's mites to equal one quadrants. But I think what's fascinating about, you know, the widow's mites that you have in your exhibit, it, and you see little tiny pieces that even, maybe Christ even touched these. It's very and, and possible. And you can imagine all kinds of historical figures that right. we read about in our history books or in scripture. Right. Who knows who might have touched these? Well, when Christ went into the temple 
He went into mm -hmm. his fit of rage. People were selling things in, in, in the house of God. He went in and is flipping the money, uh, the, the money all over the place. Some of these coins may have been on the tables. He was flipping That's all right. over the room. So. We just don't know. But it's it's interesting to imagine. I did have a lady like on the tour one time, a little funny story. I told that story. I said, you know, this could have been the coins that Christ was, you know, throwing across the room in the temple. And she goes, that's the actual coins? I said, no, no, it could be the actual coins. I mean, you know, if Jesus wants to come down and say, yeah, that was one of the coins, then that's great. I hope you catch it on camera. But um, but still, just knowing that this coin was in existence during At uh, that our time, life yeah. is pretty And neat, actually, pretty even before Christ, they Absolutely. were using those. So they, those are Absolutely. really historical. Well, I wanted to also... Um, show this uh, mite box, and sometimes it's called the poor box or the alms box or the offertory box. And this is found in churches that were built before the 19th century. So it, if they were built in the 1700s or earlier. And this was part of, you know, the, the churches would collect money for the poor. And we no longer see these in churches, uh, particularly here in the United States, that were built after the 19th century. I instead, we have a modern-day um, mite box. It, it comes a, during the season of Lent. It's made out of cardboard. It's put out by the Catholic Relief Services, and it gives households an opportunity to help the human family around the globe. And children especially love these uh, because they can put in their own money, not any designated amount, but you know, any extra change, and it teaches them that spirit of giving right. and the spirit of helping those who are less fortunate. So we have, you know, the modern day mite box, which is, you know, no longer heavy metal like that one, but it is uh, cardboard. Well, in the Catholic Church, Wanda, we've, we, you know, we're, we're very strong into helping the poor and helping the homeless. And, you know, in the, the famous lyrics from um, O Holy Night, to live, he taught us to love one another. You know, and, you know, if you had a little bit extra money when you walked into the church, you would throw it in because that money is going to help the poor. It's going to help the homeless. And we all have bad times. And the Catholic Church um, is accredited to, you know, helping the poor, mm -hmm. helping, you know, victims of hurricanes, um, helping poverty stricken countries. Um, and we got to take pride in that. And a lot of, you know, uh, misconception about the Catholic Church, too, is, you know, you know, you Catholics think you're going to you're going that you got to buy yourself into heaven by helping. Well, no, we don't. Jesus wanted us to love each other, you know, as we love ourselves and everybody else. So we have a duty to help the people who are in need and, and, mm -hmm. and whatnot, and that's what that box was for. So mm -hmm. it was there to, you know, take care of the church and to take care of, of God's people. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I also know you have brought uh, something else uh, with you. Um, did you want to show us the uh, other coin that you yep. have that goes back to the Holy Land? Absolutely. So this one's got, we do have a, a close to probably about 45 um, ancient coins going back to the time of Christ and even up to about four, 400 years after. But I think this is a, and also a good point to point out. Um, people come to the museum, and for many years I thought this as well. The words BC and AD. Mm -hmm. BC, before Christ, we mm -hmm. know that, okay? A lot of people think AD means after death. death yeah, but it it's does a, no. not. So, as you just said, it, it's Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord which is Latin, Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, from his birth. So that's actually when time, we, we, can, we go forward. So we're in the year 2018, 2018 years after Christ's birth, not from his death. So, and, and Jesus lived 33 years. So that's a, that's a lot of time mm -hmm. there, 33 years worth of time, if you're mistaken that. Um, so, but most of these coins are dated that way. So this is a Roman coin um, used between 69 and 79 AD. Um, it's a Vesparian uh, denaris. Um, so it's got the head of the emperor on it as well. But this is a pretty in intact coin, and um, we do have uh, different styles of denares and in different um, conditions in these uh, pretty cool little uh, cases here. But just something neat to see that these were the coins of the time mm -hmm. and, the, and the currency. Okay, also in scripture we hear about the oil lamps. and. Um, 
there were different kind of oil lamps. I know you've got uh, several there at the museum. Yeah, we have about 35 or so of these and uh, different styles. Again, you know, this was at a time where, you know, you didn't have a lot to do. You know, I mean, I don't mean that in the wrong way. You were you're tending for your family, but you weren't coming home and popping on a movie for four hours at night, or you know, getting on your iPad. You know, so when you were making things for your home, you took pride in it. So a lot of these oil lamps are very detailed with art. Um, and they're actually very beautiful um, with the descripting on it and the designs that were put into the terracotta or the clay that they were made out of. Mm -hmm. um, but the oil lamps were actually had several different uh, purposes in the home. Um, I don't know if you have something you want to talk about or no, not, do, but, go, go. but um, so the larger hole that you see there is where the oil went in, and obviously candles weren't really uh, around yet. Mm -hmm. it, you know, you didn't have wax available, so you had oil, and you got it from different places. The smaller hole is where the wick went, so um, it was burning, just kind of like a like an old light that you would have in your home. It's got the oil on the bottom with the wick on top. Mm -hmm. Um, so you would just set these, some had handles, some of them actually look kind of like genie lamps even. Um, you set them around your home, but these were added fragrance to your house. Um, that was just one of the things. They also added light and added heat, and you would light these for your prayers as well. Um, this was at a time where, you know, putting jokes aside, people stunk. <laughs> you did not bathe regularly at all. And the only time you really bathed yourself is if you were going to a wedding or a, a big event, um, you cleaned yourself up. I mean, we, we take for granted the fact that we can just hop in the shower every day and be clean. But um, even recently when I was in Ireland, um, our tour guide took us to an area and we met a farmer. <laughs> And whew, <laughs> he was a sheep farmer, all right. <laughs> and I asked, uh, I asked him afterward. I said, "Man, he really has a bad odor." And he says, "Well, in this area, they still don't even have electricity or running water yet. So the only time that he will actually bathe is if he was going to a wedding or going into town or to church." So, I mean, even still in this day and age, we still have people who are living like that. And it's, you know, you've got to, what you've got available. So. But I bet he had soft hands. Because of the lanolin, you know, the, the yep. sheep. Yep, yep absolutely. And, and, the, and the property was just, I mean, breathtaking, untouched. No power lines, no cable lines, just beautiful. Mm -hmm. But it, it makes you appreciate today, though, what we do have. And, uh, you know, you, it, that, little, that little oil lamp was huge. Mm -hmm. Without that, you didn't have light. And they weren't very big. They no. weren't very big. Um, the, the oil lamp that we just saw... Um, is one that was probably used 45 to 35 BC. Mm -hmm. So they were around for a long time. Now there were different kinds of oil lamps. Uh, the uh, the ones that we see were the Roman mm -hmm. terracotta yep. lamps. And as you pointed out in the hole, they you put olive oil. And sometimes yep. they added a fragrance, and. Um, the Jerusalem oil lamp, I don't know if you have any in your collection. We do. The, they're black, mm -hmm. and the reason they're, they're black is because of the way that they were fired. They were fired without any oxygen, so they were turned completely black. But they were also considered very durable and were highly prized. Right. And then there were uh, the um, Samaritan oil lamps and those oil lamps um, were had a, a seal over the opening where you would put the oil and th that was for ritual purity the only one who could break that seal was the one who had purchased that lamp so those were uh, interesting things for me Absolutely. to learn about the the oil lamps. Um, I understand you have something else here. You have some. I did bring a piece of pottery here, okay. um, going back to about the same time as these oil lamps. And this is a very beautiful and pretty intact little pot here. This actually may have even been used to hold the oil in reserve mm -hmm. for the oil lamp, and then dumped in to the large hole. Um, uh, it's amazing to be able to hold pieces like this. Um, and pieces like this we don't necessarily need to wear gloves for. Um, um, different textiles and things we do. But what's amazing about this is just 
knowing I'm holding a piece that's going back to about the time of Christ and that it has made it this long. Mm -hmm. Now you might think, oh, that's a priceless piece. Well, it is to me, but these things are found in digs every day. You know, in, in, a, in a single home, somebody may have had 30 or 40 of these holding spices and oils and different things. Um, and they really don't disintegrate. Um, the conditions there um, uh, really preserve these things in the ground. So they can find them and take them out of digs and uh, the oil lamps again or something that mm -hmm. they find in digs every day. So, um, but still to see it in person, to, to hear about mm -hmm. it, but to actually come to the museum and see these pieces is uh, mm -hmm. it's pretty neat for people. Mm -hmm. so. Now they won't be able to hold them because they're in a display case Correct. and that's probably just to protect them from being broken. Absolutely. But we uh, have a an image of a, a Roman uh, jug, and these were used for, you know, storing oil, wine, you know, taking to the well for uh, to get water. But this was your typical um, Roman terracotta uh, jug, and sometimes they were of the 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 uh, gray color, similar to the little pot that you brought with you, and. Uh, you know, the, the other one, this one, you can see it's very plain. This one's a little decorated with some relief work. And they are completely, the, the Roman pottery was completely different uh, from the Greek pottery, as you can see here. Greek pottery had paintings and it was glazed, but they served, you know, identical purposes. Well, you know, when I look at pieces like this and I think about the Bible, I always think about the wedding feast of Cana, mm -hmm. where they had run out of wine. And, you know, that's actually the first uh, miracle that Jesus performed. And he was asked to do this miracle by his mother, the Virgin mm -hmm. Mary. You know, son, we've ran out of wine. You know, we'll have the, have the men take the clay pitchers and pots and fill them with water and bring them to me. Mm -hmm. And then turning the water into wine. Um, but very similar materials to this would have been the clay and terracotta pots. That's right. That would have been happening. And they probably at a wedding feast would have been larger vessels than, you know, what you brought with you or what we saw on Absolutely. the screen. Absolutely. Giant pitchers, probably mm -hmm. three or four feet tall. Yes. Um, and just, you know, but, but a neat thing, a wedding feast was a huge event back then. And again, you bathed to go to it. I mean, not easy, you know, to find soaps and stuff was expensive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you had to make your own soap or oils. Um, but to bathe yourself and to dress in your finest and go and wine was expensive. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, to run out of wine, they probably didn't have a lot in the first place. And, you know, this was a celebration of two people coming together. So, but really neat. Mm -hmm. So we talk about the spear. Well, uh, I think all of these things we, you know, as I said, we find all of these in scripture as well as the spear. So this is a, an interesting piece. Again, this is um, mainly copper, and you can tell uh, it's got a very green patina on it. Copper turns green once it oxidizes. So if you've ever been to the Statue of Liberty before in New York City, it's mainly copper. And guess what? It probably actually never looked shiny copper f mm. for more than a few days, or probably when the time they started getting it out of the crates, it was already oxidizing and turning green. Um, this actually does not destroy the metal like rust would. Rust, mm -hmm. um, copper really doesn't rust, but um, steel and other metals do, and that literally eats away at the metal. Um, but this is a second century Roman spear. Um, and what's neat about this is it's probably very similar to the, pure that, the spear that would have pierced Christ's side. Um, we all know the story that storm was coming and Jesus and uh, the two thieves were on the crosses and uh, the order was given to, to break their legs. They needed to kill them off now because the storm was coming at the end of the day and they needed to leave. So they went to the two thieves, broke their legs, um, they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead. So the, uh, the, the centurion that was standing there actually took his spear, which with one of these attached on the end. Um, and actually, I think we have a picture, too, of, um, the, of the, the spear with, with the, the stick. shaft. Yep. Mm -hmm. And literally took this and pierced Christ's side with it. Um, from that side, wine and water flowed out. Um, and immediately it is, it is said in the Bible that the centurion kneeled down and said, this truly was the Son of God. Um, because of this miracle that happened. So this isn't the spear, but would have been very, well, it could be, but, <laughs> but 
again, this is uh, very, very close to what the spirit would have looked, at, looked like that Pierce Christ side. So, and again, amazing thing to see something like this up in, in person. Um, now, lots of these are found. Um, they were used by the guards. Um, and it was a weapon of choice at the time. Um, again, easily made. Uh, material was in abundance. Um, you didn't have guns yet and things like that. So this was uh, just the weapon that the guards would have had. So. Well, this is a, a, a very common weapon that was used in combat throughout history. Yeah, even up until, you know, you had the machete at the end of a gun. Mm -hmm. You know, during the Civil War, you would have taken your gun and, I mean, so the spear goes... The bayonet. Mm -hmm. Yep, we've got the Indians. You know, we've got arrowheads. Same mm -hmm. kind of idea, carved out of flint or stone mm -hmm. and then attached to the end of a spear. Mm -hmm. um, you also, you know, t to, kill, to kill your dinner. You know, you'd have a spear and, you know... And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, next thing you know, mm -hmm. you got bacon and eggs. <laughs> but, that, <laughs> but, the, but the spear is the most common weapon used in warfare through, throughout history. Absolutely. I have an interesting little tidbit for you about the spear. Mm -hmm. um, it has been observed that the Western chimpanzee in Senegal, if you can picture Africa, uh, at the very top is Morocco, and right below it, and this is the Atlantic Ocean over here, so you have Morocco, the Western Sahara, Mauritania, and right below it is Senegal. And it's been observed that the Western chimpanzee in Senegal uh, has broken limbs, straight limbs, from a tree, peeled back the bark, chewed one end off to create a spear, and then used it to hunt bush babies in their hollows. So the spear wow. is not limited to human use, we have found. We have found that That's the awesome. chimpanzee also has learned to use the spear without any anyone teaching it how to do it. It has just be, been instinctive. It's amazing how you learn new things, and I and I hope those of you who actually watch this this show, you know, I hope you're learning new things before. It's amazing, um, just you know, when you listen to history and just pay attention to artifacts and what they want to say to you and what they want to convey. It's pretty cool um, just to learn where we came from. Well, I think it's even cooler to actually be at the Jubilee Museum and see these items firsthand. It's just not the same. Viewing them on TV or on video, it's just not the same. You have to actually be there and you can appreciate these artifacts that are centuries old, thousands of years old, and and it's incredible to stand there and imagine who may have used these. Absolutely. Some of the people that you have read about in history may have actually touched some of these things. Well, I think we're getting to the end of our program. So, Sean, what is coming up in October? Could you tell us what you have planned? So, uh, here um, coming up, we've got, you know, always, you know, you see in the, in the promo, our nativity scenes display is coming up. I can't believe Christmas is already around the corner. It comes like that every year. But um, starting the Friday after Thanksgiving, come and see our nativities. They are... Um, going to be up all the way through Epiphany, and this year, Wanda, we are close to 450 nativity sets in the building. I think you've got a wonderful collection. I, you know, I love that you have the nativity scene that used to be at the cathedral. Yes. That was there on Broad Street, that you now have ownership of that. that Absolutely. That's a, a you know, history of our diocese. Well, and some of the sets that we have are just amazing. Um, you know, so I encourage you to come see them. We have Christmas music playing, and then again, use that as an excuse to come and see the museum. Um, our other artifacts are on display as well. Um, you know, and one thing I think I, I want to leave people with, Wanda, is we're talking about interesting facts and amazing things. We talked about these artifacts today. Um, one of the most amazing artifacts would have been Christ's tomb. They would have used tools.
tools like the spear, um, you know, made out of the same materials, rock on rock. Um, and I believe Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea had the tomb prepared for Christ already. Um, and gave it to Jesus. But the ladies would have came with pots like this with oils to prepare Christ's body, wrapped him in the Shroud of Turin. And one of my favorite stories that still gives me chills, I tell people at the museum, is when, the, when Mary Magdalene came to the tomb, she found the shroud rolled up on where he was laying, and she found the cloth that was laying over his face folded in another place in the tomb. And the reason why was it was an old Jewish custom in the old days that if you were sitting at a dining room table as a Jewish person, if you folded your napkin and laid it on your place setting, it let the servants know, I'll be back. Mm. So Jesus was giving us symbolism right away. Um, but when I, when, I, when I think of the tomb, I can't help but think of these artifacts and you know, what happened and the things that Jesus left us and the things that go back to the time of his life that can really help, help us believe and help us pull ourselves into the faith even deeper. Well, thank you so much, Sean. We look forward to, to you coming back again. Thanks as always. This is the end of our program. We thank you for watching. We'll see you again next time.